Hi, my name is Lauren Ostermann. I work at the Institute for Theoretical Physics at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. I'd like to talk about subradiance via entanglement in atoms with several independent decay channels. That is work that has emerged at our institute together with Martin Hebenstreit, Barbara Kraus and Helmut Rich. Now, as this is sort of in between quantum optics and quantum information, Martin and Barbara do quantum information, Helmut and I do quantum optics, I thought it's a perfect fit for the COVID conference. Now, what am I going to talk about? First of all, I will introduce the notion of multi-level dark states, so to say the extreme of uh, subradiance. So if you take subradiant states, and I will explain that in a minute, and you sort of put them all on the same spot, all the emitters in the same spot, you will get a dark state, a state that is completely decoupled from the electromagnetic field and thus has no dipole moment, there is no interaction, it's completely dark. So I will introduce this notion of multi-level dark states. Secondly, I will show you what these multi-level dark states uh, can do what uh, mathematical properties they have. And lastly, I will show you how we can prepare those uh, multi-level dark states, both probabilistically by time evolution, more in a quantum optics kind of manner, and deterministically in a quantum information kind of manner by using quantum gates. So, as I said, um, subradiance is collective um, spontaneous emission. is a phenomenon that occurs when um, several quantum emitters are in close vicinity to each other and you have a destructive interference between the emitted light of the individual emitters. So I would like to start with a brief uh, recap of uh, spontaneous emission. So we all know this, you have an excited state and a ground state and when the excited state uh, decays to the ground state, of course the emitter is coupled to the electromagnetic vacuum, you will emit a photon and this happens with a rate uh, of gamma, where gamma scales uh, cubically with a transition frequency and quadratically with uh, the transition dipole moment. Of course, we all know this. This is the um, Weisskopf-Wigner result from the 1930s. But you can go further and, as I said, if you have multiple emitters in close vicinity to each other, uh, some collective states will build out. And this is also a well-known result uh, from the 1970s done by Robert Lehmberg. Um, so what happens here is um, we'll have a sort of decay cascade that builds out here. We'll have a ground state with all the emitters, both emitters basically being in the ground state. In the single excitation manifold we have a symmetric state and an asymmetric state. Uh, where the symmetric state is a superposition of ground and excited state for each atom uh, and the asymmetric state is an asymmetric superposition of ground and excited state for each atom and of course we have the fully inverted, the doubly excited E state. So uh, you can do the math and then find out that uh, basically the energy shift that occurs in the single excitation manifold, so the upward shift of the symmetric state and the downward shift of the asymmetric state um, as well as the collectively enhanced decay rate and also the collectively suppressed decay rate is a function of the interatomic distance and the dipole orientation. This is what is shown on the plot here. So uh, the solid curve shows sort of the addition or subtraction of the spontaneous emission rate and uh, the dashed curve shows the energy shift that occurs in the single excitation manifold. And you see here uh, the solid curve, if the distance goes to zero, the solid curve goes to one. So this means as gamma A, the decay over the asymmetric state, goes with the single atom gamma minus this gamma Ij, uh, in units of gamma Ij here, of course. So you have one minus one is zero and the state becomes completely dark whereas the cascade over the symmetric state on the right hand side here will feature double the spontaneous emission rate and thus this notion of super and sub radiant states. Okay, so this is known, but what happens now if we add an extra decay channel for each atom? So we give the first atom a second ground state and we give the second atom a second ground state. And in fact, there is no known dark or subradiant significantly subradiant state in the system. So a subradiant state that if you reduce the atomic uh, emitters to one single spot that will actually go dark and uh, where the emission, spontaneous emission rate will actually become zero. But we found out that if you sort of add uh, one extra um, emitter of those uh, type of emitters, so you have three, three level systems, you can actually come up with 
such a state. And I will show you this in a minute. But first, let me introduce the dynamics that we have in our system. So, of course, uh, the complete uh, dynamics of the system in a uh, quantum optics kind of manner is uh, described by a master equation and we have a Hamiltonian uh, coherent uh, part um, of the collective dynamics or the time evolution of the density operator and a Liouvillian part, uh, an incoherent dissipative part of the dynamics. And uh, the Hamiltonian, of course, has two parts. One is the uh, bare atomic energy. So uh, for each atom, for each transition, uh, yeah, for each atom and for each transition, so the atoms are denoted by I and the transitions are denoted by J, we have sort of the bare atomic energy and also we have this um, energy exchange, dipole-dipole interaction, cross-talk uh, between the atoms, but for each individual transition. So the transitions in the atoms do not talk to each other, but each transition in each atom talks to uh, the, all the same transitions in the other atoms. So we have this sum over IK here, uh, for the atoms and the sum over J for the transition. Same is true for the uh, Liouvillian. So again, we have uh, gamma IK, uh, which is sort of the combined spontaneous emission rate, the collective spontaneous emission rate between atom I and K. And we also sum over the individual um, transitions that are present in each atom. Okay, so this is our model. And what we see now here is if we denote this state up here, so this is really the dark state that we found. And you can observe that in the upper line, uh, there is sort of uh, all the cyclic permutations of E, G1 and G2. And in the uh, lower line, there is all the anti-cyclic permutations of E, G1 and G2. And the cyclic ones have a positive sign and the anti-cyclic ones have a negative sign. And uh, down here, we've plotted the time evolution of such a state in a triangle with an interatomic distance of 0.3. So the state is not completely dark, but it's very subradiant if we were to shrink down the triangle to sort of just one spot, this blue curve here would just be a horizontal line and the sub, uh, super radiant decay, excuse me, the super radiant decay would go even further. So we can clearly see a distinction between this uh, Psi 3D, which we call the dark state uh, and its sub radiant behavior and its super radiant uh, bigger brother, its analog, where all the signs up here would be positive um, we have this very, very fast decay as compared to the uh, individual uh, non-collective atomic decay. Okay, so, but uh, of course uh, with this we can go further and we can generalize this notion um, of a um, dark state in a multi-level, uh, multi-partite system and we can write it down like this over here where we sum over all the permutations uh, that are valid in the Sn, so in the group of uh, sort of all the elements from 0 to n minus 1 and we call 0 the ground state and uh, 1 to n minus 1, uh, no sorry, we call 0 the excited state and 1 to n minus 1 are all the ground states g1 to g n minus 1. And this is how you can sort of uh, write that down. It's, it's quite similar to the Slater uh, determinant if you, if you think about it. So this is a way of generally writing that down. Okay, so coming to the mathematical properties of uh, those states. So first of all, all the dipole moments of these guys vanish. So if you uh, look at the expectation value of the dipole moments of the jth transition, you will see that it's actually zero, that it's actually zero. So there's no electric dipole moment. It doesn't couple to the electromagnetic field. Secondly, you see that the bipartite entanglement, and this is sort of where the connection between subradiance and entanglement now comes about, the bipartite entanglement of one individual emitter with all the rest of the system is maximal. And this can be seen by uh, looking at the reduced density matrix of one single atom, of one single emitter, and you see that it's proportional to the identity matrix. And this means that there is no individual information stored uh, in the single emitters, uh, and therefore subradiance is a purely non-classical and non-local phenomenon. Next up. Um, this state is completely invariant under all um, invertible single particle operations. So this means that you can take a measurement on one single particle, announce the result of the measurement and then deterministically transform the state to uh, psi dn minus one. So you've basically lost this one particle 
And you can do this with local unitary operations only. And this makes it an ideal resource for the Byzantine agreement problem, the N strangers problem, the secret sharing problem, the liar detection problem, and many, many other quantum information applications. So lastly, let me talk about how you can prepare this state. So first of all, you can do it deterministically in a quantum information kind of way by using quantum gates. So you start out with a bell state between zero and one and tensor up a two state over here. And then you apply this unitary, which is denoted down here uh, for a certain amount of time. So two pi squared over nine. And you apply this uh, x sort of uh, cycling through gate or exchange gate, if you wish, which maps 0 to 1, 1 to 2, and 2 to 0. Uh, and you apply this here with its uh, Hermitian conjugate, of course. Um, and if you do this unitary, you can deterministically end up with our Psi 3D. So, of course, this example, as it's written up here, is also for three atoms. Again, for three atoms, you can also do it probabilistically. And notice here the difference between Psi 1 and Psi 2 over here. So, in Psi 1, we have a bell state between E and G1, tensored up with G2. So, already some finite overlap with Psi 3D over here. And uh, in Psi 2, we do not have this overlap. So we tense up the Bell state between E and G1 for the first and the second emitter with G1 in the third emitter. And if we now do the time evolution here, and this is done for a system that is completely reduced, that is completely reduced to one spot. So this is why Psi 3D here is just a horizontal line. Uh, if we do the time evolution here, we see that Psi 1 ends up, the green line, ends up with a finite overlap with uh, Psi 3D. So you can just sort of wait until you've uh, reached this uh, sort of non-decaying dark state Psi 3D. But the red curve um, Psi 2 does not because there is no overlap. So you just have to prepare it uh, in a proper manner. And lastly, in terms of preparation, you can also start out with all the atoms, all the three atoms in this case, in the excited state and just let the dynamics do its thing, do its thing. And um, you will end up with sort of a 1% um, contribution or 1% one, 1 population in uh, Psi 3D and uh, these Psi 1E and Psi 1G. Here are, we have a chain of three atoms. Here are the um, population in the excited and in the ground state of the middle atom of the three atoms in the chain, just to uh, sort of demonstrate the dynamics that are going on here. All right, um, with this, I'm actually already at the end. And to conclude, uh, I would like to summarize that uh, subradiance can persist in systems which feature more than one decay channel. Those subradiant states that show up here are highly anti-symmetric and, and highly entangled, sorry, are anti-symmetric and highly entangled states, multipartite states that is. And lastly, I've shown you that you can actually prepare and use those states both probabilistically in a quantum optics kind of way and deterministically in a quantum information kind of way. Finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to advertise our numerics framework, quantumoptics.jl. So if you do uh, quantum optics or quantum information numeric simulations and you like Julia, a very new and efficient programming language, I really suggest you go to qojulia.org and check out our numerics framework. And if you have questions or uh, some requests, we're always happy to look for some new ideas and implement them in our framework. With this, I'm at the end of my talk and I hope we can all meet in person in a not too distant future again. Thank you.